Michelle. This is my so-called handmade life. I have a blog by the same name and that's my name on Instagram. On Ravelry, I am Mamatronic and there's a Ravelry group for my so-called handmade life. This is a, um, I always have episode threads in that group too with show notes. There's notes here and notes on my blog and comment, comment, comment because your comments are how we make this like a conversation and it's just not fun without your participation. I really do appreciate your thoughts that you've shared with me. And you help but be a conversation that meanders, right? I mean, I can talk all day in front of a camera, but it's not as interesting as when you guys are part of the conversation. So uh, it's a knitting, crochet, making, whatever, me talking kind of podcast. Sometimes they go long, but you can always take it in chunks if you need to. So I haven't done one in a couple of months, basically. Um, I was all set to do my next one a week after the last one. Um, I even have nice little notes on my iPad, you know, with highlighting and everything, um, trying to make it a little more streamlined. And then just so many things started happening in my nation on top of the pa pandemic, right? I was just my heart wasn't in it. I just felt so sick inside and I felt that way for just weeks. I also had a, um, a test knit I was working on and I just kind of forgot about my test knit for a week or two there and got behind on it. I just was feeling heartbroken and disgusted and worried and in disbelief. I'm sure you can um, understand wherever you live, but especially if you live in the United States. And in this episode, I'm going to talk some about racism, systemic racism, and uh, uh, so anyway, if you don't like to watch podcasts that talk about things in the world that are happening, if you just want to see a podcast that's like zoomed in on stitches only, this today won't be it for you. Um, but you might try listening and see, you might be surprised. You might not be as upset as you think you'll be. It's been, you know, discouraging, uh, knee jerk reactions, people not listening. And I'm thinking, how are we going to work together to reconcile this and heal the mistakes of the past? So all this stuff's been heavy on my mind and podcasting seemed like the least important thing. And several of you have reached out to me and mentioned, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. And I keep saying I'm going to podcast more. So I, I am back today. I missed you guys. I missed watching your podcasts or keeping up with you on Instagram or Ravelry. And um, I missed hearing what you would say in the comments, hearing from you. So... I don't know how far I am in, but I haven't talked about making anything yet. Um, let me say last week's, or last, sorry, last episode, the sound was terrible. I'm so thankful someone let me know. Uh, you probably had to turn your TV up super high to hear it if you listened to it. And then you might have forgot and then turned on something else and, you know, had your ears drums blasted. Sorry. Uh, I figured out my problem. It was just my camera settings were off. Um, the dog might have done it with her nose or I might have done it playing around with a mic that was crappy. Louise, you mentioned that the bike I showed in the last episode, you have one similar, like a, a cherished vintage bike. And you also watched uh, a red Lovely Bicycle, which was LB Handknit's um, bicycle blog years ago and I'll just say guys if any of you are interested in having a nice bicycle she has a lot of info on upright bikes um, vintage ones making it affordable and a lot of sources for where to find things and information it's just a wealth of information and it's a good way to get a quality affordable bicycle Margaret said that listening to my podcast is like listening to a blog post. I love that. Thank you for saying that, Margaret, because this is an extension of my blog. <clears throat> and one of the things I talked about in my last episode was I get hesitant about opening back up on my blog. I, um, 
I go through spells in my life where I just kind of close up like a fan and then others where I start to kind of open up and uh, that hesitancy probably it's a confidence issue it probably ties in a little with that whole imposter syndrome thing um, but also all the things that have been happening recently it's been a time for me to be listening a little more than talking so uh, I appreciate you saying that. Patty also is wanting to get back into blogging. She kind of left off crafting for a while, so she quit blogging. Um, Ivana, you mentioned that when it comes to doing something that I feel that hesitancy toward, if I just kind of align myself with what brings me joy, release the resistance, that things will start falling into place. I appreciated your thoughts on that. And when you said that I am real, and that's rare these days, that um, I don't compromise. Uh, that was interesting to me. I appreciate you saying that, first of all, because I want to be authentic. That's part of why this isn't a very polished podcast, <laughs> because I'm not a very polished person. But when you talked about compromise um, in a different way, I've been thinking about that a lot in regards to just online communication. So blogging has changed very much and the monetizing of it, whether or not to do it, things like that. Um, I just have a lot of thoughts about that and I haven't fully formed them all, but I'm interested in what you guys think about it. Um, I know right now the monetization of everything crafty is a real frustration for a lot of people. So I want to talk about that in another episode, maybe the next one or the one after, but uh, I did appreciate your input about that. So I'm going to be hosting a make-along, and it's called the Love Your Neighbor Make-Along, and it will probably, this will probably come out Saturday night or Sunday morning, so July the 20th will be the starting date for, that's a Monday for the, the make-along. It's not a knit-along, it's a anything-along. Like, it doesn't even have to include fiber. Although, there is a giveaway prize at the end that's fiber-related, but maybe I can work something out for somebody who's not into knitting or crochet at all, or weaving. But, um, the focus of that is not really prizes. It's not what you knit. It's not an ad for anything. It is simply all of us, we use that hashtag and we answer the photo prompts and we discuss them on each other's Instagram feeds. Just communication and encouragement to each other as we're trying to learn more about how to be better human beings, how to love one another and love our neighbors. So uh, I'll have some photo prompts and some of them will be real simple like um, share your favorite site or Instagram feed for um, anti-racism information or something and then some will be you know pictures of your stuff at home you know what you're making and things some of them are kind of fun and a lot of them are just to help share information in ways we can give and when you're sharing it on your feed you're sharing it with everyone who's doing the make along but you're also sharing it with other friends you may have and so they'll find out about that food bank or whatever a lot of you are already doing that and great good for you that you are. If you want to just add this hashtag and play along with this, that's great. Because the more you participate, there are some digital pattern prizes that I'll randomly give out. It's just a two-week make-along. I'll randomly give those out and then there's a really good prize at the end. This is also an any craft, any whip, you don't have to finish on a time limit kind of thing. So basically just do what you're already doing but follow the photo prompts. It's so easy. Um, the final prize is a combination of pattern and yarn. The pattern will be, I was thinking drive-in movie, but you could use any um, pattern from Norika, Nori Chan knits um, that you want, and then yarn from Fully Spun. It's a two uh, skein combo. They're complementary, so I'm very excited about that, and man, I'm already jealous of whoever gets that grand prize. Um, anyway, it's just all just loving on each other and encouraging each other is what it's about. And so, here's the thing. 
I'll talk about it some on my Instagram feed, but who is your neighbor? Why well, say love your neighbor? Um, a lot of you probably grew up hearing the phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. And maybe you know where it's from, maybe you don't. A lot of you might have grown up like I did, sitting in a Sunday school class, hearing the story of the Good Samaritan, which is um, where this uh, phrase comes from. So, you know, Good Samaritan is a bit of a misnomer because it's suggesting that all Samaritans were bad, so this is a good one, and that was Jesus's point. Long story short, someone asks him, so teacher, what do I have to do to get into heaven? What do I have to do to be righteous? And he says, just love God and love your neighbor, and that pretty much covers it. And the guy's like, okay, well, um, who exactly is my neighbor? And, and so to answer his question, Christ gives him a story. And I'm going to have the link to the story if you want to read it. Um, it's <laughs> really uh, kind of a, a story for all ages. A really a, human na a tale of human nature, for sure. And the point of the story is, at the end of reading it, you see that your neighbor isn't just someone who lives by you. They don't have to live by you. They don't have to look like you. They don't have to believe like you. They don't have to even like you or want to talk to you under normal circumstances. You may not like them. Helping them will inconvenience you and it will probably cost you. And this is who your neighbor is. So um, that pretty much covers everybody and it's really difficult at times to do. So. You know, there's people I want to get better at loving and supporting and standing for. There are also people I feel an angry with right now, and I don't want to be hateful. I still want to love my neighbor, all of them. So uh, the whole make along thing is just kind of stoking our um, encouragement for one another as we try to be better human beings to each other. And uh, I have already the information up on my Instagram all the photo prompts and everything and so and if you want to encourage friends and stuff to join please um, share it you know or send it in a message to a friend so they can see the post and maybe they'll want to join in you don't have to do all the photo prompts at all but you know the more you participate the better your chance of winning a prize all right so um what's been happening here uh I am wearing my Wyeth Pullover, which is by um, Alicia Plummer, and it is the test knit that I took on, knit, blocked, realized I had a different dye lot for most of the sleeve, but not all of it, unknit it, reblocked, released um, pictures on my blog and everything, and I didn't tell you anything about it. And I just feel like I've been unfaithful to you <laughs> by not sharing it to the podcast. But um, this is a, I don't have great room here to do this because I'm up close due to lighting and stuff. And also my house is getting more and more cluttered since this whole lockdown thing. It's kind of frustrating. This is a really um, open neckline. I really like this neckline. I don't think, but I have maybe two sweaters that are like this, this one and another one. And I think this is a very flattering neckline. Also, uh, if you tend to feel like constricted easy, like me, like I'm kind of weird about clothing that's tight or pulls, I love having a little breathing room. Now I knit the small, I would probably normally knit a medium, for the arm size. Uh, you can see that I have plenty of room here, you know, ar around and in the bust and all, but uh, the arms are meant to be fitted. So this is a drop shoulder style, right? And then it's meant to have fitted arms and this is the correct fit. These arms fit, they're not tight. I don't know if you can tell, you know, it's not popping back all the way. They're not tight. It's very hot right now, and I don't have my AC going because it messes with the sound of the video, so I'm going to have to take this off in a second. But um, I tend to like lots of room in shoulders and arms and things. I just don't like to feel constricted. So if I had knit a medium, 
I think the neckline would still fit fine. I would still be okay on ease and it would be fine. So it's just something to keep in mind. If you're like me, I don't have the bust size to match my arm size, if that makes sense. So I, um, I often look at arm size, but I didn't for this pattern, mainly because I wanted to use uh, shelter in the old world colorway and I didn't have enough for a medium. However, while I swatched for it, I realized that such a dark blue, I didn't think these textural arrows would show. So these arrows are what makes this pullover. And you know, her Wyeth cardigan came out years ago. It's a long open front cardigan with the same kind of um, arrow design. I wanted that to pop. So I decided to use Deep Stash Patton's Classic Wool and this is that colorway. If you saw my sweater episode, I knit one uh, for my husband. I held two strands together to make a bulky sweater for him, and it's really good. It looks good on him, and I really want to take it from him because it fits so big and cozy. But this is the same colorway, so now I have my own. Um, however, it being almost 10 years old, I would get a little here and there when I would go to Joanne or Hobby Lobby back when they had Patton's Classic and I actually had two different dye lots and I couldn't tell. I had it all knit. I was blocking it. It was just going to be done by the deadline and I saw a, a serious line right here about two inches into the um, sleeve it's lighter and then all of a sudden it got darker and I was like oh crap I hadn't even noticed because I knit a lot at night and it was dark so I had to make a decision I was already going to have my pictures up the day after or two days after everyone else on the test knit and Alicia was really kind with us because so much was happening in the world then you know a lot of us were struggling <laughs> to get our test knit done because you know life has been crazy, I decided to go ahead and rip the whole sleeve out and just cast on with the darker color because I didn't have enough of the lighter one. So the thing, this is an, a neat trick. I don't know if you can tell. These are actually slightly different. I see it. I see it when I hold them up and I look at it. This one's a little darker, right? But when I'm wearing it, I mean, you didn't notice, did you? You didn't notice until I held them up side by side. You would have noticed the line right here, though, if it had changed mid-sleeve. But if you start at the seam with the darker one, the seam does a lot to hide a transition in color because it's already a transition in the direction of the stitches. These stitches are going down. These are going to the side. Plus, you have that ridge that creates a shadow that kind of... Um, uh, obscures the the line where a darker color would be starting and uh, it just and also kind of a trick of your eyes so I think it worked out fine I hated that I got my pictures up later than everyone else but I, I just I don't normally do that with a test knit I felt bad but she was wonderful about it so this is a wonderful knit um, I can say in normal circumstances, this would be a fun knit. I didn't have fun while I was knitting it because I felt like the world was falling apart, but I did feel glad to have it with me. Uh, you know, when I looked down and realized, I came to after a week or so, and I realized I've got a test knit to finish, and I started working on it. I worked while I would read, I worked while I would listen, while I would talk to people, while I would uh, watch the news. And it was comforting to have that project. This is, um, this can become kind of intuitive. You know, you've got a pattern to follow. You know what the arrow looks like. You don't have to totally focus on the pattern. And uh, you can kind of know what's coming next. So it works for conversation or for distracted knitting, but it's still got something there to keep your mind busy if you need that. So I really appreciated having this pattern there. And I also appreciated using my favorite, or one of my favorite colors of Patton's Classic Worsted. It's the Jade Heather colorway. I actually love some of their tweed colorways more, but I don't think they're making them anymore. So Jade Heather is still out there. All right, 
Now I've got to take this off. <laughs> Ta -da! All different. <laughs> so some other things I worked on that were a little different for me. I, you knew that I was working on Nitty Natty's float tote. I finished the tote part. I did this a while back. Um, she has an option, I believe, on how to do the finishing edge, and I really liked this little um, stitch at the top. I also made mine a little taller than hers simply because I knew how I wanted my um, stripes to look and I needed a little more, a few more um, rows to get the, the blue, as much blue and gray as I wanted. So the point of the float tote, if you don't already know, is you can carry it, you can use it like any old bag, a market bag, a beach bag, a purse, or a knitting bag, a crochet bag, and then you fold the top down and inside you have an insert that also holds the bottom and my inserts not finished so it's tiny it's going to be big it kind of holds the bottom makes a sturdy base and it can be pulled out and on this insert which is going to be bigger there will be five snaps she has a pattern for just three or two or whatever but I'm gonna do the big one five snaps and you snap on yarn cozies that you crochet so I'm not through the pattern that far yet, but it will hold five skeins of yarn. And I need that for patterns like this. I've got this pattern going. It is <laughs> a huge jump. Look at this, it's gross. Um, it is Golden Willow by Leslie Ann Robinson, and I worked on some of these textural brioche stitches in her class at Knitting in the Hills Retreat. So I'm using these three colors of, I believe they're all stroll tonal from Knit Picks. Inverness, maybe Thunderhead, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, it holds, you can put each one in one of those yarn cozies in that fit on this insert and it holds them steady so they don't get all jumbled and turn in your, uh, um, in your bag and then become a big mess. It keeps track of all those floating strands. So the float tote. Anyway, uh, I'll show you my progress on Golden Willow. I haven't gotten very far at all. Uh, all the other happened and I did a test knit and signed up for another test knit. So this is uh, the first section of textural brioche and then this is the second and I just began the third. If you look, this is really interesting, isn't it? Even now, if I were to look at this on a pattern, I don't know if I could say what type of textural brioche it is without looking at a reference. The brioche is still not totally natural to me. But I could set this down and feel confident about picking it back up because Leslie gave us notes on how to do these uh, stitches. And I feel like the notes are so good. They're so, um, they contain everything I need. I can totally set down what I'm doing and pick it right back up and get going. I really appreciated her class. So what I used for this, I marled this with the gray and the blue. It's Lion Brand Re-Up, and this is a recycled cotton. And you know, something it says on here is that you're saving the planet stitch by stitch. And, uh, shiny glasses. Um, you can serve, it looks like it says 5,900 cups of water per ball. Could that be real? Is that really how much water is used? to make uh, yarn. Um, there's some interesting uh, articles like Making Stories has a lot of writers that talk about um, sustainability and there's some articles there and then also um, Aja Barber has a Instagram feed and she'll often talk about fashion and how destructive it is to the well-being of the people who work for those companies, communities around the, their um, dying 
processes and then like just the waste and the use of consumption of our resources so I'll have links to that just because it's interesting but I had no idea so this is Lion Brand Reup and I did actually have this actually gets a little broader at the top than at the bottom. You can't tell, it's just a few stitches, but I just am not at a point where I can recognize and read my crochet stitches yet. So I think I was crocheting into the chain stitch and not the first single crochet at the beginning of each row. Another thing I have an issue with is like, you can see the starting line makes kind of a diagonal. So when I'm doing stripes, that's evident. If this weren't striped, it wouldn't be. I don't know that there's any fix for that. Um, if you know of one, let me know. I tried kind of fiddling with it and hiding it, and some rows did seem to hide it better than others, but it was also messy, so I was like, forget it. I'm good. I can carry that side toward my body if I was really worried about it, but I'm not. So that's something I worked on. Also, crochet. And those are, that's my second real crochet project. Uh, my first one is Alexandra Tavel's um, canteen bag. Now, this is not going to be easy to show in this little room, but I also don't have it filled. It's got just a little bit of yarn stuffed in there. But I am I'm not quite sure, there's dog hair all over it too, I'm not quite sure how I want to fasten it. It's not made to have a fasten, I, um, a fastener of any sort. This works by itself, but I feel like it needs something to hold its shape a little better. So I was really proud of this. I'm proud of the way it looks. The front side one side was a little bitty bit bigger than the other so I stretched the smaller one out by blocking I mean I asked how you would block it and I got some great ideas I uh, use a Tupperware container or plates but I actually had nothing the right size so I just shoved some I still have some plastic grocery bags and I just filled I had enough plus other things, bags, I just filled it and shaped them in the canteen shape. But you see how it kind of sags. Um, let me just show you first. I did a few modifications. So she has a modified um, version on hers where she used the strap. It's a faux leather strap that Lion Brand sells. <clears throat> the pattern, <clears throat> excuse me, actually has a strap that you crochet, but I liked her version where she used this little swivel strap. And so I ordered the strap and I think I already had the yarn in my stash. Then I used these D-rings that I also happen to have and I made up these little taps to hold the D-ring. That was just kind of something I winged. I just used one little tassel here. Now on closing it, one person on Instagram made theirs a little larger to be a backpack and they were going to use a snap. That way they could stuff it full of yarn and projects and it would be able to stretch. But I'm considering using a zipper at the top. I feel like if I had a zipper, I could keep the shape a little better and it wouldn't quite do the sagging that it's doing right now. Because even when I stuff it with things, it just has a bit of a misshapen look to it. So if you guys have any hints on how to make a little crocheted bag like this keep its shape, I would really love to know. Another thing I had to do was knit, I mean crochet very tightly so that the fabric would be nice and sturdy. And maybe I didn't crochet tightly enough. I sure feel like I did. Um, and this looks like the size of her bag in her pattern sample. Um, I held two strands of 24-7 cotton by Lion Brand together and that was kind of hard when crocheting very tightly because the, need, the hook kept wanting to just grab one strand. And I felt like I had to do almost every crochet stitch twice. Grabbing one strand, whoop, whoop, grab another. That was frustrating but probably that's because I'm new to all of this. This was a neat 
fun pattern to do. Um, I recently put up a blog post on the Sunset Ringer, and I told y'all all about it last summer that I knit from Alexandra. This was my second pattern to do from her, or maybe my third. I have one more to show you still, but I'm not going to bother today. But I talked in the last episode some about imposter syndrome, and I wondered if you guys had experienced it, and Ada had to look it up and uh, find out what it was. And when I looked it up, it was basically kind of focused on perfectionism. It was where you doubt your own accomplishments and you have a persistent internalized fear of actually being a fraud. Like you don't deserve anything you work for or attain. You know, that you're always a loser kind of <laughs> in your mind. Um, and it often comes out in the form of perfection. Ada took an online quiz and it said she was 20% of, uh, had that, you know, kind of to a degree of 20%, but years ago she thinks it would have been higher. I think the same is probably true for me. Um, I see it in myself. I don't know that I ever would have thought of it under that title, imposter syndrome, and um, I'm sure people have suffered from things like this for ages, but just call it something else. Maybe low self-esteem or confidence issues or shyness or, you know, a bunch of other euphemisms. But <clears throat> one thing that stood out to Ada on the quiz was it asked, are you able to take compliments? And she used to not be very good at that. And I had a lot of trouble with receiving compliments. Um, a lot of people, especially women, will downplay what they've done and make it look like it's not that significant when it really obviously was something they did a lot of work to achieve. And men are not as much like this as women, which is interesting. Uh, I often would diminish compliments people paid me. Um, it was very hard for me to accept them. And then one day I realized that kind of like um, Ada said, you know, she said that a person's comments reflect more about their character and how they see the world than they do about you. And that works for good and for bad. So imagine if someone's super negative to you. You might say, well, I, I don't have to listen to that. That's not true. That's unwarranted. But what about somebody who's positive and they see you in a positive light? When you deflect that, what are you saying about their um, vision of the world. You know, I don't want to discourage that. So to me, accepting compliments was part of respecting someone else's thoughts. And I learned to do it first on their account, but then eventually, yes, even for me. If it was true, then it was true. I can have that be said about me, you know? Um, um, some of the ways that uh, imposter syndrome will come out is a sense of perfection. People drive themselves to get everything just right um, in a way they would never push another human being to live. And uh, I definitely see that in myself and have often seen that in myself as a child. Um, and I've noticed that like we're now in what the fourth month of the pandemic and I think I'm actually starting to deal with like some real excessive energy and anxiety. I mean, it's not like debilitating, but if I have imposter syndrome, well, then I'm having it more than I was. You know, if I felt a lot of nervous energy before, I'm definitely feeling it now. Uh, it's coming out and like obsessing over not only what's happening in the world and why am I not doing more? How can I do more? You know, when I can't fix it all. <laughs> But also, like, these cats that were abandoned next door, like, obsessing over what am I going to do with them and coming up with a trap, neuter, release plan and, uh, you know, just things like that. Like, I've been feeling a lot of excessive worry, um, excessive self-consciousness, self too. So, anyway, you, you may be there with me. Libby was a professional musician and very accomplished. And then when she left the music world to raise a family, she's found that everything else she tries does not 
match up to the standard she set with her professionalism in music. Like, that's just her gold standard, and nothing she does will ever seem as good, and so she feels like a fraud. Like she's just half-assing it, you know? And that's tough on you, but at least you see it, Libby. Certainly you're able to handle it if you can see it. Um, that perfectionism, you know? Um, also, in kind of in line with what Libby said, people feel like they have to be an expert on something. So they don't want to make a move until they've got all the facts and they're totally ready to go and have all the knowledge of the ages to do it. That's very me. I'm like big on researching. And of course, sometimes it's so useful, you know, we do a home, you know, remodel project. I'm finding out all kinds of information, finding the cheapest way to do it, the best method. I'm Googling sources and stuff, all helpful. But when it comes to my personal creative projects or something, it's almost crippling. Like I just am paralyzed because I never know enough and I'm never going to be able to do enough. Um, that's another thing, like having to be the expert. People with imposter syndrome usually work alone. I'm guessing there's for many reasons, but one I heard of was they're afraid that their work methods will reveal that they're a fraud that people will see how they work and see that, oh yeah, no, you know. So it's almost like once they get the whole project together and present it, it's like a facade. Oh, but all the jumbled work that went behind it, you don't want anyone to see. I don't know. I think everyone's a little that way. You know, if you saw my notes scribbled for something, you would think, wow, this person's crazy. They often work too hard because they have a lot to prove. And also feel like there should be a natural genius to things. So when something doesn't come easily, they think, well, I'm just not smart enough for it. Like you have to be a genius and it has to all come to you naturally or you're just not fit to do it. I think children often go through this when they're young, like certain things, learning, it just makes sense. It's natural. It fits with your, your development and it's fairly easy. And then you hit a wall. And for some it can be younger, for some it might be older, but there's some subject that there's no way you could know unless someone taught you. And that's where a lot of kids, their grades will start falling in school because it's not easy. They actually have to focus. They actually have to do their homework. It doesn't come just like that. People with imposter syndrome might perpetually give themselves a hard time about not naturally getting everything you know, so these were just some interesting thoughts for me. Um, a thing that a lot of people with that syndrome have in common is often they've been in a very critical environment. So usually it's from childhood. Maybe they've been raised in an abusive environment, especially an emotionally abusive environment. And um, they have all these negative things they've heard their whole life, plus their own negative thoughts. And they are battling those negative, you know, conversations all the time. Then there are other people who work in, say, like the art scene or they are some sort of artist where you kind of rely on critique and reviews. They're just hearing criticism constantly. And that can kind of trigger uh, imposter syndrome type reaction. I think that the verbal abuse thing has really been heavily on my mind for the last few years. I've really been seeing, still in my mid-40s, traces of the effects it had on my confidence as a person. Um, I didn't experience that when I was a small child, but from the time I was a teenager on, there was someone in my home that was extremely abusive verbally. Lots of mind games, and um, it was crippling to me. And uh, just being able to talk about it in the last few years is, it's not, I wasn't physically abused, but just being able to talk about that has been a big deal. Really healing to acknowledge it. I mean, and they're, they're a mess. <laughs> they're a mess. And, you know, people are, can be abusive to you and then later they get old and you see them and they're a mess and, you know, you're not all full of hate but you recognize damage was done. So seeing it really does help with the healing. I just wondered 
with all those negative thoughts that are constantly going through your mind. You know, I never feel ready for anything. I am always waiting for the other shoe to drop. My, my biggest thing is I'm going to screw something up. I'm going to mess something up. I used to have the phrase, I'm such a screw up. I'm such a screw up. Go through my head all the time in my early 20s. It's so unhealthy. Um, but I haven't felt that way in ages. But I gotta tell you, the last month or so in this whole staying at home, locking down, watching the world on fire, I am finding, I am feeling that way more than ever. On top of that, a lot of the answer racism work, you know, you're reading about things and you're seeing, crap, I didn't do anything when this and such happened. Why didn't I call this number before? Why didn't I protest? Why didn't I sign this petition? You know, I'm feeling really convicted about not doing enough in the past really can make you open and vulnerable to feeling, you know, all your old insecurities possibly. It's something to keep in mind, just like for somebody who has suffered the brunt of racism, I would say if they already deal with something like confidence issues or imposter syndrome, that right now it's probably at a high. Um, I wonder if it goes away. That's what I asked in the last episode, and Catherine said she first heard that term, imposter syndrome, at a work setting. And that's never been a place where she felt that. Um, she felt very competent there. But with family relationships, she did. And I had mentioned that um, sometimes a family relationship could trigger your insecurities. And she said, yes, she has suffered with imposter syndrome, feeling like a fraud in that respect in family relationships. But she has just learned to live with it. She has other areas of creative release. She's got areas she feels competent in, and maybe she will always feel like she's not quite competent in this or that role in her life, and she just moves forward, which is really strong of you, Catherine. I appreciate you letting me know, because I imagine there are some things we just are going to deal with. I am just going to deal with feeling like the redheaded stepchild <laughs> off and on in life. And so how to manage it is something I was wondering about. Gleanne said um, she thinks women are more susceptible to this because they're empathic and they can take the words of other people, whereas they can also be so compassionate and understanding and put themselves in another's shoes. They also take their angry comments or their negativity to heart. And, um, you know, they try to understand why would someone say this? And I, I have done that. I, I don't want to dismiss negative criticism from another person because I'm not so proud as to think I don't screw up. You know, obviously I do. But then there are some people that are just mean and abusive and they are never going to have anything positive to say. And I've just got to learn when to shut that down. Uh, I could waste days trying to figure out why would they say this? What did I do? What did I say? And a mind like mine that's seeking perfection would waste days doing that. So I'm trying to learn to just close doors and say no more of that. I um, I overthink or I worry about how I did something. Did I offend somebody? I'm so bad about worrying if I offended somebody. And I've just got to get over that. And I had, but lately it's been rearing its head. So I often ask myself, okay, I kind of have my worldview, my, my mission statement in my life. I want to please God. I want to be good to other people. You know, kind of like I said, love God, love your neighbor. And if what I've done, I still accomplish that, then I need to let it go. Okay, if it's flawed, if it's not perfect, let it go. But if I've done something wrong to hurt my neighbor, then I'm just going to do my best to fix it. Uh, Two different designers I heard in a conference once talked about fighting those tendencies in their job situation, but you could apply it anywhere. And they said they would take every negative, super negative thought that went through their head about themselves and they would just write it down like it was a problem and then have steps to solve it. So if I'm worried that I've offended somebody, well then what are my steps to solving it? Ask them. Do this, do that, make it right, blah, blah, blah. You know, you then you go through the steps and that's all, you've done all you can. The same with 
if your job you just feel like I I am not professional enough with this or I'm I am not producing enough well what are your steps to fix it and then you might lay them out and of course I would run that past my being good to God being good to others thing and if I'm being unkind to my body or to another person or to my family by any of those steps then I would eliminate those you see what I'm saying this is just personal for me how I would handle that but moving forward is progress. Not getting paralyzed and stuck is the thing. Lori said that when she was a new teacher, she was so overwhelmed. But a teacher friend told her, look, it takes three years to get your feet wet. Just get in there. Fake it till you make it. You'll catch on. And that's what she did. And she did fine. And around the third year, she felt totally competent. She wasn't faking it anymore. And the whole time she was actually doing the job well, it just felt like faking in her mind, but she was doing it. I thought that was pretty instructive. And people who might have that desire to work alone and work too hard with imposter syndrome, that might help. It's just faking it a little. And also that paralyzing negative, I've got to be an expert, I've got to do this, just fake it. Just fake it and live like how would normal people live? I've asked myself that before. How would a normal person handle this? A person, not me. How would they handle it? Okay, I'm just going to fake it and do what normal people would do. Um, Talitha said that negative comments say more about the commenter than about yourself. Um, and Pam was saying she has less confidence issues as she gets older. But her confidence was always shaky at the beginning of a change. So that makes me think again about this time right now in our lives. Everything is changing. Many people, their jobs have ended or they're on furlough. They're worried about their families. Then if you're looking inwardly and you're seeing where you did not do enough or you did wrong regarding your fellow man, it's unsettling. It's unsettling to hear that people who, you know, you sat by through a class or something for a, a a couple of years, they've been suffering in a way you didn't realize they were. It's unsettling. And so everybody's got a degree of it, but some people, of course, so much more. Um, so it makes sense that a lot of people's imposter syndrome stuff is flaring right now. What Pam did and Glenn both, they just got rid of Facebook and they got rid of a ton of the negative voices that they were hearing. You know, in Facebook, it's not even people you know that are negative. It's just negative clickbait and all. I hardly ever get on there. But um, there's family members of people that will often do take little digs, try to irritate, or maybe just show, oh, look at all the fun we're having together. Mm, guess you weren't invited. I mean, you would be amazed how many people say they have relatives that do that. That's <laughs> so rotten. So just getting rid of the app has helped a lot of people. But, you know, you've got all these thoughts in your head to tackle. And like I said, I have that filter. Okay, am I hurting anyone? Am I pleasing God? Okay, is this what a normal person would do? Or am I pushing myself too hard? <laughs> Let's fake it and act like a normal person. On top of that, um, I, I heard someone saying, I think it was Heidi Gustad was saying, you, you decide what thoughts you allow in your head. And, uh, and I also heard Tavi Gevinson once say that, um, and I, I wrote it down, her quote, she decided to let the negative thoughts in because fearing them makes them too powerful. And the good thing about negative thoughts is that they're boring. So she finds it easy to recognize them you know, and you can take it, hold it, look at it. What if I fail? Am I a failure? Maybe I'm not creative. Maybe I'm not talented. And you know, you take it out and you look at it like you would an object and just look it all over. There's no mystery to it anymore. And then she just makes her decision. Nah, I don't want to think about this. I don't want to follow this. I'm not going to believe this or accept it. And you can set it aside. I love the idea of go ahead and let the negative thoughts in for a time. They won't have any power that way. And the idea that they are boring, they're really boring. And when you follow the train of those negative thoughts, it's so boring where it leads you. 
I thought that was worth sharing with you guys. Um, Amanda said that she's accepting herself better as she gets older. Things she once saw as flaws, like being shy, she now sees as just a good, healthy part of her character. It gives her um, the ability to... Uh, she has a different sort of creativity because of it, and she can empathize differently because of it. Um, so... I'd be interested in your thoughts about this. And you guys who do have deal with this, you, even if you just want to message me privately, tell me this is a private message, I would just really be interested in how you're handling it right now. I think for me, the big thing was to realize um, I was starting to kind of get wound up over stuff like the cats next door. And I've always been one of those people that, oh, watch out, there's a cat in the road, you know, freaking out and there's a paper bag. But it was starting to make me feel sleepless. And I've really had a thing about seeing something die since my dad died that's been a little debilitating for me. Um, it was a bit PTSD. So I know that about myself. And when I started realizing I'm not sleeping good over this, I knew, okay, this is too far. I only have so much I can be responsible for. I can't solve the world's problems. I can't solve all the pet problems in the world. I can't, I can barely even keep my house clean. So, uh, you know, realizing it made a difference and then thinking, how would a normal person deal with this? It does help to look at it that way. Let me show you a couple more things I finished. I don't think I showed you both of these, wood pigeon socks. This is, I got this yarn from the Woolly Thistle, I believe. Um, she has a lot of good yarns from England and overseas. Um, you know, also I got that, uh, it was such a good deal. She had a sale recently and she had Susan Crawford's, um, that Vintage Shetland project, which is full of patterns, all of them very vintage, very retro looking. Um, really serious color work. A lot of puff sleeves there. Um, I'm thinking of one of you in particular. Uh, I'm thinking so many of those styles would look good on you. Katie, you know who you are. Um, but I finished these. This is like a just a scrap Knit Picks Hawthorne pearlescent colorway, I believe. I, I like this wood pigeon colorway. I think it's nice and, you know, subtle colors. But they have coordinating uh, this is West Yorkshire spinners, and they have coordinating skeins for heels and toes and cuffs that match several of the um, colorways. I like the owl colorway. It's a nice um, neutral that could work for anybody, no matter what type of clothing they wear. You know, browns and cream colors, grays. And then um, there's blue tit and there's uh, mallard, the blue mallard, I think it's called. Uh, those are nice um, colorways also. So how have you guys been doing with quarantine? I'm apparently a wreck. <laughs> apparently I am becoming a cat lady and I'm a wreck. I'm not really becoming a cat lady. One, I've got a home for. Three, I think two of them will be okay. One only has three legs and if we move, I'm just going to have to take him and we're gonna to have to figure something out because he can't be inside. I'm sure he sprays and he can't be in my backyard right now. I think my dogs would attack him. He's so cute. I'm gonna show you a picture of him because I'm really worried about him. And I named him, so anyway. I'm not a cat lady, I promise. I asked you guys how you're doing in quarantine and if you've seen some things about life like you've reconsidered. So when you get back into real life, what are you going to do? Hang on. Hey, Adam. Yeah. Oh, never mind. Come here when you're finished. That'll be a while. Um, I asked you guys what your, um, what you would change after quarantine. And Pam said, less commitments, less appointments. She doesn't have that fear of missing out anymore. She loves this more chilled lifestyle. Christy Archer has been opening a business. And let me show you. You know, when I did that Instagram post on the love your neighbor make along, I needed a nice kind of soothing background and I, something I could like desaturate a little. 
and I used these skeins from Christy because I just recently received them. She just opened her shop and so she's been busy carrying out all these tasks she's been planning for a while plus they've moved. That's a lot to do all at once. So really her she hasn't had a quarantine experience like some people where it's just about doing less. It's um, It's been extremely busy but hopefully that's a good thing. Maybe a distraction from the stress that you could have been feeling. And I ordered these two, but she threw in this one. That's the perfect transition. So now this is a perfect fade and I'm not sure what I'm going to use them for, but they are beautiful. It's an 80, 20 Merino blend and her um, company is Christy Archer designs. Hey, we were talking about after quarantine is over, what, what you would do differently or something. You said something to that effect the other day, like when we can go and do again, I'm not gonna anymore. I'm not gonna blank. What was it? Do you remember? I know you want to eat out more, but other than that. Have a big brunch. <laughs> no, you want to do, you want to go somewhere and have a huge brunch, but what, what was it you said you don't want to do? Like, it's like a lesson learned in quarantine. Honestly, I don't remember. I've slept since then. You're useless. Get out of here. So, um, this was Atoll Lagoon and Lamb's Ear. And then this is just a custom colorway right between the two. And gosh, these are beautiful. So give me some ideas. These are fingering weight. It's 80-20, so it's around like 400 yards. I, I took the little sleeves off to take the picture earlier today. So tell me some pattern ideas. I might use the ideas y'all give me. I'm not ready to do this right away because I have so many things in the works, but uh, they're really beautiful. And I have a link to her shop along with everything else in the notes. Um, Gleanne said she has become a process knitter. Like the process of knitting has outpaced the desire to have stuff. Like she's not even frustrated when she has to rip stuff back. It's just like this opportunity to learn. She's really getting into seeing how things are constructed and paying attention to it. It's not just about the stuff. It's about the doing. That's a neat thing to see about yourself, Gleanne. Um, I love that and that really shows that there's been a calmness of mind that you've had which a lot of us kind of might be lacking. Um, in a similar vein I've been working on the Fisherman's Muse which I told you guys for a few episodes I wanted to do. Here we go. This looks really small but it won't be when I pull it off the needles. Um, it's kind of crammed onto a smaller needle. Um, and also it's going to block out a little. This is a, um, it's from Albina from the LB Hand Knits. And what it does is it has, after you knit the sweater, it's got like a funnel, a bit of a funnel collar that comes straight up here. And you know, you go down the sleeves and the body, the body has an asymmetric hem that's got like a lace to it. And I think the sleeves might too, I can't really remember. But I am using Newtonin, which is Carolyn Hinkelius's yarn um, from her podcast, Honerokere. I believe I'm saying that correctly. It's a Patreon-only podcast. It's really um, a gentle-feeling podcast, right? Kind of takes you away. And one of the, the perks of being a Patreon is you find out about her shop sales first and there's often coupon codes and things just for um, members but to do this because this is a bulky weight pattern I am holding three strands together three strands of Carolyn's Newtodon so can you see the wispiness here this one's ended here I, I I ripped these so that I could easily show you guys. The thing about this yarn is that it rips pretty easy. It also, you just moisten it and felt it. Yeah, sometimes I spit on it. You felt it back together and it's fine. And what I found amazing, knitting with it took a lot of care and time. 
kind of like what you're describing, Leanne, like what my trick is now that I'm, again, knitting from three separate uh, skeins of this, and this is take, slowing down, right? This is definitely a process of slowing down my knitting. I knit a, a, a round or two and then I need more yarn and I never yank. You know how you like might yank from your ball and then keep going? You, I don't do that because I'm afraid I'll break it, but I do just unroll like this and sometimes you just kind of let it fall. It falls off the, the skein like this. I unroll a few times and I do that with each one of these each one and then I can knit a round or two and then I do it again. <clears throat> now a friend mentioned I might could run a dowel through here and make a lazy Kate. I really don't think, I kind of feel like this might um, still break the yarn. I feel like I need to do the unrolling carefully. But I don't mind that at all because it really, I mean, having to slow down like that and you're breathing and everything's very methodical very planned and slow and happening just ritualistically i realized how much my breath and my thoughts are racing and it was an another one of those eye openers like maybe you're kind of stressed out and it hit me, I needed this. I needed a project like this that required slowing down. Like even now, I feel like I've been talking really fast. So I have more of this new to then to knit a fingering weight project. And that is even actually easier because I'm not going to be doubling or tripling strands. And I can just, you know, the right spot you just unroll, unroll it a little and then you knit and once it's knit together like I said once these three strands were knit together when I ripped them out they stayed like a almost like a it seemed almost like applied yarn it's not I could separate them if I wanted to but very much like lopi there's a lot of grab and I don't know if you can see that halo but uh this is a very rustic wool. Now, another thing I like, this seems like a very basic design, right? But it is contiguous sleeves. I've never knit those before. So that's interesting. It's not like an afterthought sleeve that the sleeve cap is knit that way. I've never done it before. So that was really uh, interesting. That was fun to do. And again, another thing that required my slowing down take my time. It's just yarn. No big deal. Um, I'm loving working on this. And so <clears throat> I've been doing another test knit, but I'm getting back into this. And this is going to be the project I start with for my um, Love Your Neighbor make along. By the way, with this project, Carolyn sent a little bit of the wool from her sheep. And just look how woolly. Isn't that sweet? See the little curly locks? It makes me think of when my son's baby hair. <laughs> you know, like right at the base of their skull, they have little curls. You can still see grass and stuff in it. That was kind of sweet. Um, my son's hair is so curly because he's let it grow out. It is so curly and it is sticking out like to here when he wakes up. It is pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, he feels like, you know, it's messy and all, but like, how did he get this great curly hair? Why? And he doesn't even want it. Lori has made an effort to connect more with people who live alone since the pandemic started. And that's something she plans to continue long after because she realized, you know, it's always hard when you're alone, but it's extra hard when you're always alone. And I think we all know people like that. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do, Lori. Louise has noticed more family time and communication in families. And she's hoping like 
for a while there, you know, parents weren't working and they would all go to the park and play with their kid or do stuff in their yard outside or things in, around the house. She's hoping that will continue, that people ha will have rekindled at least. I mean, we've all had a lot of togetherness, but maybe some of it will remain and we'll want to keep that because it's kind of precious. She also hopes that we'll give our planet a chance to heal. Margaret said she's become really flexible in her attitude um, and she's hoping that this flexibility, you know, allowing growth and change, that she'll continue that. That She's just been lightening up, I guess, on herself. Um, she's also appreciated her family since seeing them less. Obviously, yes. Um, and her biggest takeaway has been that less is more. She hasn't had Costco trips, not done any shopping, and it's been great. It's been very freeing to just not have to do that. I swear I have worn, this is, no, I'm not. Oh, I was wearing one of my husband's old t-shirts. I swear I've worn nothing but my husband's and my son's old baggy t-shirts since the pandemic started. Once in a while I've had to go do something in public and I'll wear something else. That's been freeing too. <laughs> um, you know, I'm collecting cats and I'm dressing in my husband's old clothes, but whatever. Um, Anna said that she has joined a food co-op and, and she's learning how to buy things in bulk, which is new for her and was never a necessity. But now she sees, wow, there are a lot of people who had to do this. And it does require some planning, doesn't it? To plan bulk purchases and plan your meals out. It really does. Um, and she's going to continue to wear a mask even after this. Um, I'm sure for protecting yourself, but mostly for protecting other people because that's the kind of person you are, Anna. I love all those thoughts. Thanks for sharing them, guys. So, your current projects that you're working on. Amanda's got the Apart Together socks going. Catherine is using some cotton she got from Peru and she's thinking of doing a crochet top. Did you do it, Catherine? Let us know. Ada was going to finish the body of her and sleeves of her Elizabeth first, but she's finished them both. And that's a really lovely design. It really showcases that color you used for it, which is a vibrant color. And she was planning to do an Into the Wild tank for her niece, and she's done that already. Into the Wild is one that I showed you guys. And I said I was gonna talk about summer knits. Um, we talked about them last time, and I was going to talk about some this time. I may have to cut this because it's so long, but let me show you my Villanelle sweater. So, it's a little difficult to see. It would be easier to see it if I could spread it out better, but it's, again, crammed on little needles. It's just a little easier for me to knit that way, but you can see it's, it's, um, it's going to have some ease to it. So it's going to be comfortable in the summer. Let's see if I can show how. This is a lot of ease. Uh, I am really excited about wearing this. So I need to get back onto it after I finish the test knit I'm on. Um, this is Knit in Barocco Remix Light, which feels kind of wooly. The texture here gives it some grab. And I think that's why it doesn't irritate my hands like knitting with slick slippery cotton does. I mean, I can get over it to knit a summer knit, but it is even easier when you've got some grab to it. I also use carbons or wood needles, and that helps me with cotton to kind of get some, like I said, a little leverage, a little grab on it. Uh, so some of the ones I, I was going to show you guys was... This is, I don't know how to say it, Quetlicue. Quetlicue. I looked it up when I was going to do the episode and I knew how to pronounce it. And then it's been a couple of months, so I don't now. This was in the recent pom pom. I love that. Now, I, um, I don't know that I have, I might have some yarn, some cotton, <clears throat> kind of some slick Pima cotton that would work for this. Another one is, 
I think I showed you this before, our goal, and I have some Lindy chain that I want to use to make it. It's that one in a pom-pom. It's like maybe last summer. And it's got a tie front. I like that. Now see the, the amount of ease in that tank? That looks like summer knitwear to me. I just don't want things to be very fitted. The last one I showed you looks a little more fitted and like it might be warm as a color work. So I don't know how I would do that. This is Sunwake, also pom-pom. I like that it's cropped and it is kind of lace-like so it's you know kind of got some ventilation there it's really cute over a dress or a long tank so I'm showing a lot of tank tops here Gunas is a purse and I like it it makes me think of was it Pucci? Is that the name of it? Prince? Uh, from the 70s? These colors. That looks like a fun bag to make. And then there's what Ada made, Into the Wild. Into the Wild is made with DK weight, Lion Brand yarn, but you hold two strands together and I'm thinking I could use Knit Picks Billow. I think I have enough of a color in Knit Picks Billow. I got a long time ago. I didn't really know how I would use it. I think it would work. Two DKs held together. Billow is supposed to be bulky, but to me it looks more ran. So we'll see. Um, another new to me designer I've seen is uh, Nomad Stitches. And I like this zigzag top. Again, there's a lot of ventilation here, so. Also, there's a bit of a cap sleeve if you don't like, um, if you don't like to use tank tops, to wear tank tops. So I've got a lot of fun, silly um, links. I'm gonna have at the very end of the show notes, just under funsies, um, just silly stuff. Um, they're old now, you know, but people send me goofy stuff. And sometimes they send them at the worst moments during the, the darkest of conversations. And I look down and I get this message and it's like a gif and it's got like the scarecrow dancing all crazy and it's saying, teach me how to Dougie. And I, mean, I just started laughing and it probably looked like I was crying. I started laughing and I knew I look terrible. I look like a horrible human being that's laughing at the suffering of others, but it was just that scarecrow dancing. Anyway, I've got some silly things like that at the, always, usually at the end of my show notes. Okay, so do you want to join the Love Your Neighbor Make Along? Let me know what you would like to join in with. Any craft. Doesn't even have to be yarn. I know, Nick, you've been painting a ton. Maybe you want to do a painting project. Or ten. Because <laughs> you do one every day, basically. You can do as many things as you want. But the point is just the following the photo prompts. And they're, they're easy. And also, some of them are intentionally not meant to be curated and beautiful. So... Don't worry about all that crap. Um, I think I covered everything. Oh no, one more thing. This, remember how I did Color Craze from Tammy Gore? And I enjoyed it so much in the use of minis. Um, and the minis, oh, sorry. <laughs> Look, like I come up and I'm like, <sighs> no, sorry. Um, <sighs> yarn everywhere. Okay. Color craze. Remember I showed it maybe, I don't know when I showed it, but I have a recent blog post on it with all the facts. And when I do knit something, all the details are in the blog post, like what kind of needles I used and all that junk. Tammy had a test call out for Pippin. And she said we could show this on our social media. I don't have a great deal to show because it's kind of all rolling here. 
what she did was she used, it's like a striped, but it's a very low contrast, subtle stripe. She used Knit Circus yarns and they have gradients and kits that are gradients together, but you need two 400 yard uh, gradients gains. If you want to do gradients, you don't have to, and she has testers doing everything. But what she used was two gradients that were very close in color. So one was kind of an orange and one was kind of a coral pink, but they were both light, kind of subtle colors. And she started with the darker ends of each and then slowly striping works to the end and it's really a beautiful effect. So I will have, if I don't have an image of it here, I'll at least have the link. You can find it. Okay, so I wanted to do something similar. I really don't need more yarn, but I didn't have any kind of gradients like that that were would work together. But what Knit Circus had in stock wasn't colors I wanted. So I would have had to wait and then been later with the test. And I decided to just go ahead and try and use stash and I will have to try Knit Circus yarns out later. So I did have this green gradient set from Blueberry Yarns, and I will show you these colors. There's this darkest green, which you can see here. I've already used it up. And then there's the next one, the next, the next, and the last color is very light. It's just uh, basically a natural color with green speckles. I don't think I'll be using much of this the way this is knitting up. So what I needed was something not too high contrast that I could make as a gradient to go with it and I don't have any other gradients. So I took some yarns that kind of look good together. To me this Grant's Pass from uh, Knit Picks Hawthorne is a really good neutral. It's a brown. It's, it's a gray. It's a grayish brown. There's almost a hint of purple or plum to it. You don't really see that until you have it next to Silverton. Silverton definitely has, it's a gray with a bit of a plum. And so the two look really great together, but they are very high contrast. So I added in this one-of-a-kind um, unnamed sales gain I got from Madeline Tosh. You know, for a while on the site, they had lots of things on sale that were just one-of-a-kind, you know, just like a one-off thing. And so this does make a pretty good gradient. And so it goes with all these greens. And I'm just going to follow her directions and do that. I've been enjoying it. It's got some lace work, but it's mostly pretty chill and uh, stockinette. I'm wondering if I'm going to have a lot of um, curling at the edges, so we'll see how blocking works on that. I've never, I don't think I've ever knit a stockinette shawl. I think I've always had garter and or lace, definitely garter on the edges. So this will be different, a little different for me. Um, hers is just beautiful though, and it's been a very enjoyable knit. Now I started it with the light colors accidentally. I meant to use the dark first. I don't know what I was thinking. And I got pretty far, like to here, and I realized, ugh, I am probably not, I'm probably barely going to be able to use my dark green. And so I didn't like that. So I ripped it back, and I, because I had started so soon on it, I started with the dark colors and those are my favorites so I get to use all of them and I'm only using three of the gray variants so I will just kind of mix up when I change the grays I have been wondering what you guys think though about the monetization of crafting um, do you feel like it's gone too far uh, different patterns coming out they're suggesting yarn that's very expensive. Of course, we can all make substitutes and we have Ravelry to help us, you know, do that. Other people's projects, but um, I just kind of wonder what you think. I've always been kind of about approachability and um, I always admire things that are very doable and approachable to everyone. That's just me. I don't require that 
of other designers and things. In fact, um, I've always found ways to make a more expensive design more affordable if I needed to. But as far as monetizing blogs, monetizing podcasts, what do you think about that? I'm interested. I'm not saying I'm going to do or not do anything based on what you say, but I probably actually will be informed quite a bit by your thoughts on it. I'm going to collect my thoughts on that and get some information together and maybe we'll talk about it in the next episode. Since it's been such a big deal the last few weeks, the price of certain kits and yarns and even patterns going up, how do you feel about patterns over $8? How do you feel about pay as you can patterns? Do you think it's working? Pay what you can? Um, what about patterns that don't offer alternatives, cheaper alternative yarns? Um, do you feel less than if you're using a budget yarn? And is that anybody's problem to fix? Or is it, uh, is it on you? What, what, you know, I'm just curious what you guys think about the monetization of everything, of information about crafting. Everything costs now. And so, you know, when you have a blog, just about every blog is monetized. What do you think about that? How do you feel about ads popping up all over a blog? One, two bother you? Just three? Um, I know there are certain designers, they'll say, you can get this pattern free on my blog, but you have to put up with ads. I feel like that's fair. Because there's an alternative. You can pay them a few, a few bucks for the pattern if you don't really like the ads. But otherwise, you've got it free. I kind of love that. I saw a story that was so interesting about uh, someone shared it on Instagram, the, our internalizing capitalism. Do you feel like we've done that? So much so that um, we almost feel like anything we do, there needs to be a price tag attached to it or we're a failure. And so doing something like podcasting or blogging for free is less than. Um, I'm just curious what you guys think about uh, and I'll talk more about that, internalized capitalism. I'd never heard that phrase, but I really liked it because I feel like we've talked about that some in the past years. And lately, as I think about blogging and where, would I, where I to monetize something, I don't have that many readers now or viewers, but what if I were to, you know? What if I were to actually have more to offer and monetize? I'm not sure where I stand on all that, but I'd be interested in what you guys think. I hope you have a good week. I missed you all. I hope everybody's doing good. Join the Love Your Neighbor, make along, and we'll just have a big love fest. Bye. <laughs>